Welcome to AP European History with Dr. Blavkin. Today I'd like to continue our series of lectures, or mini lectures, or videos on the issue of shameful pages of history. The question basically is, how do the Ger Germans feel about the crimes of the Nazi era? How did their attitudes change? Did they ever recognize uh, what had happened? Did they actually think it through in terms of responsibility of a nation, especially a nation with a cultural past, especially a nation of Mozart and Beethoven uh, and, and uh, uh, German philosophers, uh, a, a nation that used to be called in the 18th century Ein Land der Dichter und Denker which is a land of poets and thinkers. So how could it happen that in the country of thinkers and, and, and poets, you have these horrendous crimes? And what do the Germans think about it uh, in terms of uh, historical development? Now, uh, this is, of course, a huge topic. There are hundreds, literally hundreds, books, both in German and in French and in English, on the Nazi Reich and its aftermath. And it's very, very difficult to summarize concisely, you know, these very complex issues. But we have to. And so I decided to treat this subject of a kind of as a history. What is the history of German attitudes to the Nazi Reich and to uh, the responsibility that they feel or may not feel? Now, the short answer, the Germans did feel responsible, but let me go over how it developed and who said what, and in a sense, the meaning of it all as it shaped through the current, through the decades following World War II. Roughly, in a, in a very approximate way, I would put this history in three big periods. The first period would be from 1945 to 1965. So this is like the first period, uh, first two decades after World War II. Now, again, this is the time when you had two Germanys, when you have East Germany, German Democratic Republic, and you had West Germany, uh, Federal Republic of Germany, and they were quite different. So let me go one by one. As far as West Germany is concerned, it's a very, very see, easy answer. The war topic and the, and the Holocaust, it didn't exist. Nobody talked about Holocaust. The term didn't exist. The extermination of the Jews didn't exist. The killing of three a million Russian prisoners of war didn't exist. Nothing of the war existed at all. The Germans lived in those times pretty much as if nothing had happened. The history books stopped at 19. 33 or in 1918. The kids were not really taught much about the, the war because they didn't know how to handle it and also because so many people in West Germany were actually living, you know, acting two decades early. In other words, if somebody was 20 in 1935, uh, so they were, they were 40 in 1955, they were, they were 50 in 1965. So this was like the entire population of adults were people who lived through the Third Reich and they have, may have done something uh, that they are really not fond of remembering. Very few people were like Conrad Adenauer, who basically didn't do anything at all, who was in retirement, who was not guilty of anything, and therefore he, he was a very convenient figure to uh, be the head of government of post-war Germany. So in, in terms of our question, the simple answer is, it's the war topic is a taboo. Nothing has been discussed about, nobody's tried, nobody's guilty. The former Nazis reshaped themselves as new Democrats and, and the Christian Democrats and so forth. And uh, that's how it was. No denazification in Western Germany. Now let's look about the East Germany. In East Germany, it was ostensibly there was a denazification. Ostensibly, they they did talk about the concentration camps and the horrors committed under the Nazi regime, but they talked as if it is a kind of a foreign regime. So their official ideology is that Germany is liberated by the brother country, the Soviet, not 
do anything themselves. Uh, that is how it was presented to the public. Now, in fact, of course, uh, a lot of people who lived in East Germany were the ones, just like in West Germany, who were uh, actors in the Nazi Reich, and many of them were, were, you know, didn't have clear consciousness as well. But this was sort of presented that now it's a, it's a free country of workers and peasants allied to its big friend, the Soviet Union, that is intrinsically uh, anti-fascist and therefore uh, they have felt no guilt whatsoever about anything that they've done. Now, uh, this, th this brings me to the second period, uh, which is the period from 1965 to the uh, approximately mid-80s, early 90s. There's no one year that one could say this is the end of the period, uh, and, uh, uh, and and there's no clear distinction. But approximately from the mid-80s, uh, th this period uh, lasts, from 65, approximately. One could date it from 68 to 69. In any case, this is the period, uh, a century, uh, associated with the name of Willy Brandt, who was a, a social democratic chancellor of Germany, replacing the ro long rule of Adenauer and his successors, the rule of Christian Democrats, and it's truly a new era in German history and in the attitudes to the war and to the Holocaust and the crimes of the Nazi era. Now, the name of Willy Brandt is mostly remembered today in terms of a very dramatic scene that he did uh, in 1970 when he went on a visit to Poland uh, and he was taken to the memorial to the uprising of the uh, Jewish ghetto in Warsaw and he put flowers on it and then he went on his knees. This was absolutely incredible, dramatic sight that a German chancellor visiting a communist country of Poland, but also a neighboring country of Germany, uh, paid his tribute to the victims of the Nazi oppression. Uh, this is the beginning of a totally new period in German history, not only in terms of our question, the attitude towards the war, but also in terms of policies. And briefly, it's the beginning of the Ostpolitik, which I think is one of the most remarkable policies in Europe after World War II, that essentially changed the perception of Germany, not as an inheritor of the Third Reich, but as a Germany that became a new face, that became pacifist, democratic, uh, truly peaceful, and truly conscious of its own uh, responsibility. In fact, this is the famous words of Willy Brandt, which is uh, the uh, community of responsibility, Verantwortungsgemeinschaft in German. So, <laughs> Ostpolitik meant that there would be a new relationship with the east of Europe, including Russia, that there will be reconsideration of Germans' role in the war and in the crimes of the Nazi era. And this is the beginning of this sort of opening up, one could put it as a kind of German glasnost. This is the beginning of reconsideration and opening up the, uh, the archives and talking about uh, the Holocaust and, and the crimes and the SS and the uh, uh, decision to exterminate the, new, the, the, the Jews and the Ostsee conference and it just list goes on and on and on. It's a period of uh, reconsideration of the past, a period of revelations, uh, a period of rediscovery of the, its own past and the responsibility of the German people for uh, what happened. Now, it has so happened that I was a, a young man and a student in Germany in those days, and I speak German, of course, and I, uh, I, I, saw, I saw it happening in front of my very eyes. The, the people that I shared the dorm were young German students in the early 1980s, and they were the ones who were raising the questions uh, to their parents. What did you do uh, during the Nazi type? What did you do? Were you responsible? How could this generation do what they did? And if they didn't know it, 
why didn't they know it? And why didn't they care to find out? And there were all kinds of shows and discussions on TV, you know, whether they, the Allies knew about the Auschwitz and whether they could have bombed it and whether it was really a, a, a worker's camp as, as it was presented to the Germans or whether it was an extermination camp. In other words, it was a period of sort of searching and it just started out in the late 1960s and just continued in 1970s and 1980s. And what I find most remarkable is that there was a kind of a moral self-searching of the Germans who finally realized that they are responsible as the people. So the answer is yes, the Germans were responsible. They felt through it is a painful experience and they understood that unless they deal with it, there is no future. And they dealt with it. And I think they dealt with it successfully in a sense that Germany did become indeed a very pacifist country. Uh, it was totally against the war. I remember how there were these huge demonstrations against Atomwaffen and about atom bomb and they were against atomic energy and about stationing of new American troops and Pershing two missiles. All of that was one package which is uh, a profoundly peaceful movement against the war in general and against the war in particular in terms of what the Nazis did to Europe and to the Jews. So this is the uh, rediscovery generation and the result of it was uh, you know a total success uh, pretty much to the present day that every German school teaches about the Holocaust and every German school is taking children to the Auschwitz or concentration camps. They've been preserved, they're made into museums, by the way, which has not happened in Russia, they've all been destroyed and nobody goes to any Stalinist camps as museums. So this is a big difference. However, let me go to the third period. After this incredible period of self-searching and rediscovery and admission of guilt, we come to the third period. And the third period starts somewhere in the 1990s. And I want to emphasize, it's not like the third period was a kind of a forgetting or denying uh, what was done and admitted in the second period. No, it was a little bit more refined, but it was a school, it was so-called revisionism in history. And let me explain to you. They revised attitudes uh, saying a few things like, it was not only Germany that is to blame. Uh, and that the Allies were to blame too. And there was a lot of anti-Semitism with America. And why didn't they bomb the Auschwitz? And why didn't say anything at all when they found out what was going on there? Well, ostensibly because Roosevelt didn't want to provoke anti-Semites in his own country. Uh, or is it that they didn't care about the Jews? Why did they bomb Hamburg and Dresden but didn't bomb Auschwitz or the railroads to Auschwitz? In other words, there was a whole lot more research uh, and there were huge publications in German universities, centers of study on the Holocaust, but not only on the Holocaust, but on the German society and German army and, and the home front and what was produced and when and the forced labor, all kinds of things in a much, much greater detail were researched and presented in the 1990s and going to the contemporary times. But in terms of revisionism, they began to ask uh, a little more complex questions. Yes, we admit our guilt, that is uh, for sure, but what about other things? And so they began to ask very inconvenient questions. Inconvenient because uh, the United States and Britain are number one allies uh, of, of West Germany, and the inconvenient questions are like this. Who made a decision to make the, the bombing of Dresden in 1945, two months before the war, that killed 250 million people in one day? No answer exists, and this is what the Germans are saying. How come nobody knows to the present day who made the decision to kill that many people, and this is a war crime? How come nobody researches and investigates these war crimes committed against the German people? Now, the next question, what about Hamburg, what about Stuttgart? If you look at all German cities, they were pretty much wiped out by the end of the war. Who is responsible for this? Has anybody been tried for these war crimes? Nobody has. Now, they also begin to ask questions, what about the 5 million Vertriebene, which means displaced persons, which means German population literally kicked out 
thrown out of historically German lands in East Prussia that is divided between Poland and the Soviet Union uh, from Posen, uh, from the uh, Order area at the River Order, and of course from Sudetenland, which was a punishment for uh, uh, detaching it from Czechoslovakia. So millions and millions of Germans did displaced. Now that's a crime too. Well, how come we, this is not investigated? Nobody's talking about it. Nobody is admitting it. Nobody says a kind word that these people were people too and have a right to live in their own homes. So this is the thing that's going on in the 1990s and early 21st century. And finally, uh, Germany today. Now the interesting thing is that there's a kind of a young generation, and I as a school teacher meant many times to German schools and had conversations, their world of view is like this. Yes, we pretty much admit that the horrible things have happened and we as Germans are responsible, but, and this is the but that it's important, they immediately add, now, but the United States is guilty of slavery and of the extermination of the Indians and they have no issue on the agenda to ever discuss these things and to say sorry to anybody. Uh, they also uh, begin to talk about uh, the uh, bombardment uh, by the Royal Air Force and some people privately told me many interesting stories about how the French occupation troops behaved in 1945-47 uh, when, the, when the French brought in the colonial troops uh, from Africa to Germany and the kind of rape uh, and free-for-all that occurred uh, in a few cities in southwest Germany. Another taboo. So basically, to summarize my story is that yes, Germany did uh, go through the painful research or search soul of uh, its responsibility. But at the same time, it has not yet received answers uh, about things that were done to Germany by the Allies and nobody seems to be in any hurry to discuss those issues uh, that I just listed. The displaced persons, the bombings and other crimes against the German people. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much and I hope to subscribe and see my other videos, AP European History. Bye.